With good reason, many desserts from New England reflect thrift and practicality. In leaner times, resourceful colonists relied on locally grown ingredients that they could preserve. Before ovens, hearth cooking was commonplace and things were baked to last. I'll share four regional iconic specialties. A very flavorful cheddar crusted apple pie. The cheddar is right in the crust, believe it or not. Boston brown bread baked right in a can. A deep dish lemon blueberry tart. This is the fanciest of the desserts. And long lasting, very tasty hermits. Today on Martha Bakes. For a twist on a New England tradition of serving apple pie with a nice thick slice of cheddar cheese, I like to surprise my guests by serving my cheddar crusted apple pie made with grated cheese incorporated right into the pastry dough. It makes it even better. For the crust, two and a half cups of all purpose unbleached flour, a teaspoon of salt. It's basically a pat brise with cheddar in it. One tablespoon of sugar. Mix this up a little bit so that all those ingredients are well incorporated. And then add your butter. One and a half sticks of butter. And I'll cut this in by pulsing. Just want to break the butter up into sort of, oh, they always say oatmeal sized pieces, but you can still see the butter. Good. One and a half cups of shredded or grated cheddar cheese. And I'm using a white cheddar. You could use a yellow cheddar. And this is a, a mild cheddar. Incorporate that into your dry ingredients. And then approximately a half a cup of iced water. Add the water until you have a moist dough that holds together but isn't too wet. That looks good. And I'm not using all the water. So let's just see. I think this is just fine. Look how nice it holds together. Okay. And when I get into the pie crust mood, making pie crust, I make a lot of pie crust at the same time. And I freeze discs so that I have it ready to make a pie whenever I feel like making a pie. If I see beautiful peaches or amazing apples, I will have the discs of pastry right in my freezer. And how easy is that? So now form this into two discs. I'm gonna take away a little bit more than half. This will be the bottom crust. The larger will be the top crust. And fold this all up, encase the dough, and make sure you press it together really, really well. And now this one. and get this right into the refrigerator. For the filling, in a bowl, peel, core, and cut up four pounds of Granny Smith apples. To these cut up apples, add a quarter of a cup of flour. That'll thicken the juices of those juicy, juicy apples. A half a teaspoon of salt, which just brings out the flavor. Two tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. Freshly squeezed, don't skimp and a teaspoon of lovely fragrant cinnamon. Stir all this up. Oh, and don't forget to add your sugar. Three quarters of a cup of granulated sugar. That's not so much sugar for four pounds of apples, by the way. You might say, oh, that's so much sugar. It's really not. This is all going into that cheddar cheese crust. The sugar will complement the tartness of these tart Granny Smith apples. So this is ready to go. So now put all those apples into this pie crust. It's going to be a mountain, but the more you add, the more beautiful the filling is. You might have to use your hands. I find that it helps you push the apples into the nooks and crannies. You want a really full pie, and that's why we roll the top crust slightly larger to cover all of these apples. And now, to make sure that the crusts stick together, use a little bit of cold water as the glue all the way around 
the edge of the pie crust. And now you can make little marks in the top of your crust to let steam escape, or you can just cut a pretty round circle in the top like that. And this can just be laid right over the pie. And work quickly because you don't want your crust to get warm and you want to press all the way around the pie plate edge. Now I like to cut with a scissor about a half an inch overhang. Remember this is that cheddar crust, very flavorful, very tasty, and it really does permeate the entire pie. That's a, it's an amazing flavor. Serve this at a holiday dinner, a Thanksgiving feast. Now, press around again. You really want to seal those edges because you don't want the juices dripping all over your oven. And so this gets tucked under like that. And now for crimping the edge, just do it whichever way you want. I'm just using my four fingers and thumb. So that looks really good. I love how this is turning out. So now make an egg wash. One large egg and a little bit of water. Preheat your oven to 425 degrees. It seems like a lot, but pastry like this, bake it hot and put your pie on the lowest rack in your oven. And you bake it at 425 for 20 minutes. Reduce the heat to 375 degrees and bake for approximately 80 minutes more. So it's going to bake for about 100 minutes. So egg and water wash. And because it's so many apples, it will probably drip over the pan. So bake it on a parchment lined baking sheet. That'll keep your oven clean and make cleanup generally a lot easier. Right into a 425 degree oven. Now let your pie cool completely on a wire rack at least four hours before serving. Don't be tempted to cut it until it's really cool. Cheddar crusted apple pie is a flavorful spin on an iconic New England tradition. Enjoy. Now here is an example of a 300 year old recipe, Boston brown bread. It's known for its moist, subtly sweet flavor, perhaps best recognized for its cylindrical shape. It was steamed in old coffee cans by thrifty New Englanders who typically served it with their version of baked beans, another regional specialty. And it's very, very easy to make this brown bread. A half a cup of graham flour, half a cup of yellow cornmeal, a half a cup of rye flour, a half a teaspoon of baking powder, and a half a teaspoon of salt, and a quarter of a teaspoon of baking soda. Whisk all of these together. Graham flour is whole wheat flour, and it has a nutty and slightly sweet flavor. And rye flour is made by milling the whole rye berries or grains from ryegrass. Couldn't be easier. Add a half of a cup of molasses. Use unsulfured molasses. A cup of sour cream. And a quarter of a cup of water. So mix this all together and one last ingredient, which I think is essential, a half a cup of dark raisins and stir those in. And we are baking ours in a can just like your great, great, great grandparents in Boston would have done. Butter a can. This is a 28 ounce can, most likely from crushed peeled tomatoes. I'm just guessing. You can also make two breads in 15 and a half ounce cans. We are going to bake this in a bain-marie in the oven. So have some water boiling. And so now put this right into a deep, small kettle and put water. Watch out that you don't get any water in your bread. Bring water about halfway up the can, making a steam bath basically. Your oven should be preheated to 350 degrees. 
cover tightly with a piece of aluminum foil. Steaming this bread yields a really nice moist bread. And this is going to bake in the oven for about one and a quarter hours for a 28 ounce bread, or about 55 minutes for 15 and a half ounce cans. Set your timer. To serve, well, generally they're cut crosswise like this, and you can make the slices as thick or as thin as you like. Use a serrated knife. Oh, they slice so perfectly. And I like mine with butter and cream cheese, but I only have some soft butter to slather on. And if you like, some pretty sea salt crystals. Serve it with your butter or your cream cheese, and you'll see why this recipe has stood the test of time. It's so good. Enjoy. Native Americans introduced the early colonists to blueberries, one of the few fruits indigenous to New England. Blueberries have a concentrated flavor, and I knew they would be a perfect match for the tart lemon curd this recipe calls for. We're gonna make a pat sucre uh, instead of the regular pat brise. Pat sucre differs only in that it has sugar and an egg yolk. We have uh, one and a quarter cups of flour, a uh, half a teaspoon of salt, one and a half teaspoons of sugar, that's the sucre, and we have one stick of butter, eight tablespoons, cut into small pieces, and it's icy cold. I just want to mix up the dry ingredients first. Okay. And then add your butter and one egg yolk. Take out your feed tube because you're gonna add a little bit of water. And I find that pulsing is better than just running the machine. You wanna break up the butter very nicely and approximately two tablespoons of icy cold water. I'm just gonna drizzle in. Remember the saying, make it cold, bake it hot. Pat sucre fits that important saying. There. Let's see what it looks like. Looks like it is not too dry, not too wet. Now because of the egg yolk and sugar in the crust, this is not as easy to roll out as the regular pot brise, which usually is chilled. This you do not have to chill, and we are going to place it in the bottom and up the sides of an eight inch springform pan. For an eight inch pan, you'll need approximately a 13 inch circle. Now, I am going to roll this dough very lightly onto my pin, and I'm going to very carefully drop it down into the pan. Stick it to the sides of the pan. I want to take it up about two inches all the way around. Now to make it even easier, just do it this way. Making sure that it has no holes, no spaces, so none of the filling will ultimately leak out of the tart. And now to make sure that it is about two inches, take a little paring knife and cut off the excess. Okay, so this can go right into the freezer to chill until it's very, very firm. Clean up your work surface. While this has been chilling in the freezer and it's nice and cold now, I've assembled all my ingredients for the lemon filling. But first I'm gonna get this into a preheated 400 degree oven. I've cut my parchment into a large round. Nice. If you crumple it, it will fit into all the nooks and crannies more easily than a clean sheet of paper would. So fit this down without disturbing the pastry and pour in a good amount of pie weights. We keep our pie weights for years 
cool them after they come out of the oven and put them back in a storage jar. So, and this can easily be lifted out once the pie crust has baked. Bake it for 20 minutes, remove the parchment, and then continue baking for another 15 minutes or so. Now, to make the delicious lemon curd, eight egg yolks, two whole eggs. Mix these up with a fork, just break them up. This is a lemon filling, and it's made somewhat like a custard, but you can cook it directly on the stove top. Lemon juice, one cup of lemon juice. Mix this together and pour this right through a sieve. Sometimes we actually strain after we cook. Like this we're doing before, just to get out any of the impurities from the eggs. Push it through the strainer. There, everything went through very nicely. And now two cups of sugar. Two. Turn on your heat. Cook until all the sugar is dissolved over a low flame until the mixture starts to thicken and coats the back of your spoon. I tend to generally use a wooden spoon for stirring hot mixtures. See how the spoon is completely coated? It's not dripping off. Then draw your finger right down the middle and the rest of the filling does not fill it in, does not drip into it. So you know that it is done. Right into the hot mixture, add the butter a little at a time. And you see how the butter is melting in. And the last thing you add, two teaspoons of lemon zest. And that you get, generally get two teaspoons off one good sized lemon. Stir that in. Oh, it's so fragrant. And now we really want this to be a little colder than room temperature. Just put this on a bed of ice and stir it every so often as it cools. So now this is ah, very cool to the touch. Mm, so wonderful. And here is our crust, beautifully baked. And because it was already pre-strained, we do not have to worry about straining it again. And this should come within a half inch or so of the top of the crust. Now put this right into a 375 degree oven for 30 to 40 minutes. And the curd should be bubbling at that point. And now for the topping, one cup of creme fraiche, two tablespoons of confectioner's sugar. Whisk these together. One cup of big, beautiful blueberries and three tablespoons of apricot jam. And I'm just straining warm jam over the blueberries to coat them in French bakeries. Everything's always glistening and gorgeous. So stir the blueberries to coat them. And now the pie itself. I'm releasing the spring form. Ah. And look how nicely it released. And now I want to release the tart itself, and it's coming off nicely. This is baked and chilled. Put it right on your serving platter. Now, isn't that a nice alternative to a pie plate? I think so. And now you can dollop the creme fraiche all around the outside. If you want to show that it's lemon, one way is to just leave a little bit of the lemon curd visible in the center. And you can spread this if you want, but don't let it run over the crust too much. And now you can put the blueberries on top of the creme fraiche. And to gild the lily, I've candied some very fine strands of lemon peel. Very easy to candy, you just boil some strips of lemon in sugar water until they're tender and then roll them in sugar, extra fine sugar. So beautiful. And then a mound of these very pretty candied lemon zest. And there you have a glorious tart. I think this will certainly attract a lot of attention at your next dinner party. Enjoy. Joining me today from our test kitchen is Sarah Carey, 
who's here to share her all-time favorite New England recipe, hermit bars. And Sarah, do you happen to know where hermit bars come from? Well, I think that they came from colonial New England, and they call them hermit bars because they improve with age if they're hidden away like a hermit. Oh. That's I a... mean, that's what I've been told. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if it's true or not. I think that's a, a good explanation. I just wanted to point out that in olden times, um, there were spices, and people could keep spices for a long, yeah. long time. There were probably more spices available than fresh ingredients. Right. And you couldn't get lemons, you couldn't get oranges, you couldn't yeah. get peaches in New England. Right. Uh, so many things had spices, like the Boston brown bread and yeah. uh, and uh, and now this wonderful hermit recipe. And they also wanted to make things that would last a long time. And yes. so this gets better with age and so things and, that... Uh, and not in refrigeration. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you have two cups flour there. You can do the dry ingredients. Okay. I'll start with the butter. It's nine tablespoons of unsalted butter. So I'm adding to two cups of all-purpose unbleached flour, mm -hmm. half a teaspoon of cloves, one and three quarters teaspoons of cinnamon, two teaspoons of powdered ground ginger, and a half a teaspoon of salt. They just get whisked together, yeah. so it's very aromatic with spices, which uh, is what really makes is. it so great. In here, I have a cup of sugar, and I'm adding that. It's light brown sugar, packed, and it gets creamed together with the butter. It's a stick plus one tablespoon, nine tablespoons, and a cup of sugar. As long as your butter is nice and room temperature, it shouldn't take too long. We need one large egg. And then the egg can go in. This recipe also has unsulfured molasses. Another great flavor with those spices. Sort of a gingerbread-y flavor, really, but it's a chewy, sort of yeah, dense chewy. cookie. That's what I like so about. nice. So the molasses can go in, and then the dry ingredients go in at the end. It's a quarter cup of unsulfured molasses. So get out every little bit. I'll try. Uh, unsulfured molasses, by the way, is molasses that hasn't had sulfur used in its processing, and generally preferred because it's sweeter. Flour goes in and the raisins. Here, I'll just take your dirty things Thank away. Thank you. It's three quarters of a cup of raisins. That's a buttered eight by eight baking dish lined yeah. with parchment paper. Yeah, one way. One way, way, yeah. Right, so you can lift the bars exactly. out when, and hold in place by these big paper clips. I know, that's a really good trick that I almost always forget to do, but if you don't, if you do it, it holds them in place, and sometimes if you don't, the paper flips over on top of oh, your yeah, unbaked yeah, cake and it makes a mark. Yeah, if you're a convection oven, you know, yeah. and that, that does happen. So you added your three quarters of a cup of uh, raisins? Yep, okay. and the dry ingredients, and then you just beat them together. Starting off slow so the flour doesn't fly everywhere. That's it, it's done. It's nice, dense dough. I'll take that. Thanks. Because I'm going to taste it. Oh, yeah. Well, I bet it's delicious already. Mm, it is. Very good. This just gets pressed into this dish. It's kind of sticky, actually. <laughs> and the oven is preheating to 375 right now. All right, that bakes for about 20, 25 minutes. It should still be kind of soft in the center when yeah, you take so it out. Yeah, so it's very, very yeah. dense, and that's what you want. Now, these are going to be cut into bars. Yeah, 375 degrees for about 20 to 25 okay. minutes. Well, I can really see why these are such a favorite. Thank you so much, thank Sarah. You. And thank you, audience, for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. Zip off the end of a pastry bag. Insert the coupler base, then place your pastry tip over the base of the coupler. Screw on the outer ring to secure. Fold the top over into a cuff. Fill the bag only halfway with frosting. Unfold the cuff and push the frosting upward to the tip. Twist the top to close. Secure it with a rubber band or a binder clip.